The title of the message is Grace Calling. And I'd like to start by reading Titus 2 verse 11. And if we have it on the screen, it says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. You may be seated. That he may purify his own people. And you know, I believe that prophetic word that came was so um, on point because we believe that Christ is returning and that he's returning for a bride without spot or wrinkle. Amen. And therefore, the Bible says, be holy for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Uh, the title of the message is Grace Calling. And uh, this is the thing. Grace has appeared. Have you seen it? Have you heard it? Have you responded to it? Have you received and embraced God's grace? Amen. Because it's such a vital subject. And, you know, this is the thing. Unless you get grace, and more importantly, unless grace gets you, uh, nothing will ever make sense. And nothing will change in your life. Amen. Because you will continue to struggle and moan and go from one unmitigated disaster to another. Amen. Because this is the problem. Far too many of us are trying to be good enough um, to earn what we can actually only receive by grace. Amen. And that's why the Bible says the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. And, you know, there are, like I said, there, there are people for whom life is such a grind. It's such a misery. No joy, no peace, no happiness, no satisfaction, no grace. Or at least they haven't recognized the grace that is freely offered to them by God or received it or surrendered to it in their lives. 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 1. We then as workers together with him plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in an acceptable time I have heard you. And in the day of uh, salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Here in Corinthians, God speaking through the Apostle Paul says... I plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. And, and, and that's the reality is that we could actually receive grace that does us no benefit because we don't receive it. Our, you know, the grace that is offered to us, we don't receive it. And so this is so important for us to grasp because how sad is that, that there was grace available to you, but you didn't receive it or take advantage of it. I wonder do people, you know, arrive on the shores of eternity and recognize that there was so much grace offered to them that they didn't receive. You know, grace to be healed. Grace to be delivered. Grace to be restored. Grace to be prospered. Grace to have their needs met. Grace to have their lives changed. You know, so many times I think we walk straight past the grace of God that is offered to us because we're, we're blind or insensitive or distracted. Grace has appeared to all of us, but only some of us see it or appreciate it. I mean, you're complaining about a job and yet God got it for you. You aren't talking to your husband, but he's God's grace to you. You're angry at your wife, but she's God's gift to you. You're, you're frustrated that you're single, but grace kept you from an abusive relationship. You see, grace, you were born because of it. And you've only made it to this point because grace got you here. Fact is, you woke up this morning because of grace. There are very many people around the world who didn't wake up today. But you know why you did? Because grace still has, uh, uh, you know, God still has a plan for you. Amen. And those plans are good. Like it says in Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for good and not for evil to give you a hope and a future. 
Amen. God has plans for you, and those plans are good. Amen. But this is the problem. You might say, but I don't deserve it. I agree. I know you. You're your, I'm your pastor. Amen. You don't, and neither do I. But this is the glory of God's grace is that, you know what, we don't get what we deserve. I mean, justice is when you get what you deserve. I mean, thank God that none of us receive justice. Praise God that we receive grace. Amen. And so, like I said, it's, it's God's grace. And this is the glory of grace is that we are given what we don't deserve. You see, grace gives us a little taste of heaven. The great American revivalist Jonathan Edwards, grace is but glory begun, and glory is but grace perfected. You see, God's glory, when we get into his presence for eternity, that is when grace will be perfected. But right now, you know, we, 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 God touches us at times. We sense his glory at times. And, and, and uh, uh, that is God's grace, or at least it's the beginning of God's grace. It's a taste. It's a reflection um, of what is to come. And so let me give you an illustration of grace. I was about maybe 12 or 13 years of age. I was working in my dad's garage in Castle Island, County Kerry. Uh, it was Saturday, and so the garage was closed, except for the fuel pumps, um, which were open. And, um, and so I was, I was working there, because back, back in the 80s, um, you know, you had somebody who would pump the petrol into the car for you. Um, uh, but anyway, I was just a kid, and I was working on, on a Saturday. And uh, this guy pulls up to the pumps, and it was a Volvo. I still remember to this day, it was a, something like a... 330 or 220, and it said D. So, uh, you know, I naturally made the assumption uh, D stood for diesel. But, you know, some, some idiot over in Sweden put a D on that because I don't know what reason. Um, so I put diesel in this guy's car. Unfortunately, it was a petrol. And so when he tried to drive, I mean, what kind of a person puts D on the back of a car and it's petrol? I mean, anyway, engineers. Um, so it's a big, there was a big puff of smoke and then the car died and it, it, it made it about three, three feet away from the, uh, f the petrol pump. And, um, <clears throat> and uh, anyway, uh, so I was in this, I was in this situation um, and I panicked. Uh, because like I said, there was this big cloud of smoke behind the car. The car wouldn't move away. And, and my dad had a very short fuse. Um, at least with me, um, I, I, I went up to the door. I, 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 I went up to the window of the car. The, the guy didn't really know what was going on, and I, I explained the situation to him. And um, uh, he was from Dublin. And, and uh, amazingly, this this young man didn't get mad. He stayed quite calm. But, but obviously, we both had a problem. He needed to get back to Dublin, and um, his car was full of diesel. Uh, so I was in serious trouble, and I knew it. It, it was going to be minutes before my dad um, uh, found out what I had done. And sometimes when I made him mad, he would literally do a little dance. Um, uh, you know, and um, I, I don't know why, but out of his... Out of his eight children, uh, I seemed to get under his skin uh, for some reason. Anybody ever felt like that out of your family? That you just, I was shy and awkward and, and probably a little clumsy. Um, but there was a salesman there that day. He just happened to be there. He wasn't normally there. But uh, uh, anyway, he came walking by uh, Grace. I, I was white as a sheet. And I didn't know what to do. So I, I walked up to him and I quietly mentioned my problem to him while looking around on the horizon to see was my dad anywhere nearby, um, to see my monumental cock-up. Uh, but I didn't see my dad, Grace. <laughs> I expected the salesman to be uh, annoyed with me. I mean, there was about, you know, 40 or odd guys working in, in the garage that time. It was a big garage and, you know... <laughs> They were pretty unfiltered in how they would um, communicate with you. But um, I, I thought he was going to call me an idiot and whatever, but he didn't. He simply looked at me and smiled. He, he knew I was just a dumb kid who was green behind the ears and knew little or nothing. And um, he, he calmly said, help me push the car into the garage uh, before your dad sees it. Grace. 
We, we pushed the car in over the pit. Back then, there weren't lifts for the cars. There were things called pits. They were the equivalent of a grave made of concrete. You would, you know, push the car over these, these you know, um, these wooden planks. And, um, and if you got it wrong, the car would fall in. I actually did that one day. I was driving the car and I drove into the pit. Um, <laughs> Grace, I wasn't. I was. I was never meant to be a mechanic. It was just. It wasn't in my, in my uh, God's plan for me. <laughs> but um, he said, "Come on, pull, pull the car in." So we pulled the car in. We shut the doors of the garage quickly, um, uh, uh, so my dad wouldn't see. And um, and next thing, he climbs down into the pit. And uh, it, it's it's difficult for me to explain, um, uh, you know, what a pit exactly was, but. Um, back then, you know, the, the mechanics would be under the pit. Your head was about here above the ground, uh, under the car. And um, back then, there was no extraction systems. To, many times, the garage would be black with smoke. It was, uh, I remember, it, it, was, it was, yeah, it was all sorts of health and safety violations back in those days because health and safety didn't exist. Um, uh, there was none of these mechanics with, like, gloves going around. You, your hands were black. I mean, it's funny, I used to come to church back then um, on a Sunday, and Joanna would see all of my nails. She, she always commented, you know, under my nails, they were all black. Because it didn't matter how much you cleaned them, you couldn't get the ingrained oil out. And um, so, mechanic would be under there, he'd, you know, open the, 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 the sump and drain off all the, the black oil. And, you know, you're changing, you know, maybe fuel pipes or whatever, petrol be flowing down. I, I, I often remember petrol going under your armpits, praying that nobody is smoking a fag anywhere near you. Um, <laughs> that's what we called them back then. Um, but anyway, they were dirty. Normally the bottom, bottom two inches of the, of the, uh, of the pit had, had oil and you, your feet would be sticky and, it, you know, the walls of, it were dirty. I mean, the, the garage was there since the 1920s and they'd never cleaned it once. It was just, it was what it was. You probably found a di- dead body under there, an old mechanic or something, just for, everybody forgot about him. Um, so anyway, he, he gets down there in his, his good clothes. He's a salesman. He, I don't know, was he wearing a suit or really smart clothes, but he, he climbs down into the pit and uh, the fuel tank is there. And amazingly, it had a drain on the bottom of it. Uh, it had a little drain plug and he was able to drain off the fuel. That was a miracle because normally you would have to you know, remove the fuel tank from the car, which could take hours and hours. And um, Grace. <sighs> Grace. He climbed down there without complaint, grace. He, he, he drained off the fuel, uh, grace. And he, he pushes the car back out with me and says, um, put fuel in his tank and put it onto my account, grace. Grace. You see, when you felt grace, there's nothing like it. And a few moments later, this guy drives off happy, and my dad was none the wiser, grace. I had messed up, and I felt so alone in that moment, but grace was calling my name. I mean, to be honest, I didn't even know God back at that time, but grace knew me. And, And grace sent me an unlikely hero in the form of a car salesman. I mean, many of you can, uh, you know, would find that hard to believe because they tend to be very cynical. Most car salesmen would, you know, sell their granny. Um, it's just the way it is. They're, they're a special breed. And, and I know that they generally get a bad rap. Um, you know, some of you can, might struggle to believe that they might even make it to heaven. But there's at least one. My dad. He was grumpy because he hated his job. But he corrected me because he loved me. And I needed a lot of correction. He corrected me because he cared. I remember one time he corrected me as a little boy. And I I was just angry. And I I walked off down the corridor. I went to the bathroom. And I said, blankety blank dad. Next thing I looked in the mirror. He's standing right behind me. I nearly left my body. I don't know for what reason he followed me down and he just heard his son curse him. And um, 
my life flashed before me in that moment. And before I knew it, I was lifted up in the air by his wingtip shoe. My dad always dressed well, you know, he, he, he dressed as a suit and those pointy shoes that were so painful. Um, <laughs> and that's why that day, my failure seemed like it was fatal. It seemed like the end of the world. But grace saw me and saved me. And grace sees you right where you are today. No matter what's going on and what's going wrong, grace sees you. Because you know what? I know there are people here today and you feel like it's all over. You feel like you've sinned away your day of grace. You feel like you've gone to the point where God is just tired of you. He's finished with you. No, God is a God of grace. Grace is calling your name. You know the Bible commentator Matthew Henry said, Grace is the free Undeserved goodness and favor of God to mankind. Think about that. Grace is the free, undeserved goodness and favor of God to mankind. Have you tasted God's grace? Because when you've tasted of His grace, there's nothing else that can compare. Because it often comes to us true people. And to be honest, we often find it in the most unlikely people and places. I look back over my life and I realize that there were those moments where, where grace intervened. I mean, you can look back, like I said, over your life and see the very same thing. Amen? You, 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 if you look back, you will see moments where, where God's grace was, was extended to you. I mean, why did that person show you kindness or mercy or love? I mean, why did that person give you a chance? I mean, why did that door open or another door close? Because, you know, we need to be just as grateful for the doors that closed as well as the doors that opened. Grace. You know, I answered the call of God to go to Bible school uh, in in Texas. Broke broke my dad's heart to to say I was not going to be taking over the garage. And um, I came back uh, from Bible school in, in July and I married my sweetheart, Joanna, in August, and I needed a job, and um, I'm, I'm forever grateful to Joanna's parents that they left me marry her without a job. I mean, what were they thinking? I had no job. Um, anyway, I, I got a job in the motor trade, and I, I, I was left go after about nine months, and then for a while I worked um, a, a part-time as a youth pastor. I worked in the, the Christian school, but I, I didn't, teaching really wasn't for me, at least teaching little kids. Um, and... Um, I really needed a job, and I went for an interview with, with uh, an insurance company, and uh, you know, we were at the stage where we really needed, and I really needed a good job with a good income uh, to provide for Joanna, and uh, I remember doing the interview, and I came home, and Joanna said, how did the interview go, and I said, well, I don't, I don't think I got the job, but I think the guy was a Christian, there was something in his eyes, and would you believe it, I got the job, and um, so I was working in the office with this man who was my boss, Andy McLean. Um, he was from Belfast, and uh, a wonderful man. We were very different, very different background. Um, uh, he came from a, a Protestant Unionist background. I came from Kerry, from, from a Catholic background. And, um, and, and really, it was, it was such an education for me, because I, I'd grown up as a kid watching the TV, and, and, um, and uh, you know, I grew up during the Troubles, and, uh, and, and the only unionist I really knew was Ian Paisley. And so I kind of, I, I guess I had this kind of prejudice towards people from Northern Ireland. And I just had this assumption that they were all like that. And so it really shocked me to discover this man had a great sense of humor. And um, just a very, very kind man. He went to the Met- Metropolitan Church in, in Belfast. And... Um, we, we, we grew to be great friends. I mean, he spent much of his time walking around being quite puzzled because it's interesting. In some ways, Ireland and, and Great Britain are very similar, similar culturally. And in other ways, we're like planets apart, <laughs> you know. And, uh, and, and so it was, it was a really nice experience working with this man. He loved Jesus with all of his heart. And, um, you know, he gave me my first break. That was, that was grace um, because I, 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 
you know, it, it was grace that, that, that opened the door through this man. But I remember a, a couple of years down the road, there was a, a promotion available where I wouldn't be working in the office. I would be working on the road. I'd be getting the company car. It was, it was a great job. And I really wanted the job. And he wanted me to get the job. And so uh, <laughs> it, it was just funny. He's, he's dead now about 10 years. But, uh, uh, you know, he was a very, very particular, exact person. He was a man of great integrity and honor, but he, he actually um, gave me a little gentle direction regarding to the questions that he would uh, be asking me. And um, let me just put it that way. He advised me on possible questions <laughs> that would come up in the interview for this job. And uh, it's funny, I was so eager when the interview came. I was just so hungry for this job. I started just firing back answers. And um, we came out of the interview, he's, he was laughing. And uh, he said, uh, you could have waited for me to ask the questions before you, <laughs> you started giving me the answer. Because I'd give one answer and then I'd give the next answer. Uh, <laughs> Grace. Grace. When you have someone on your side, it makes all the difference. That's why I miss my sweet little baby sitting in the front seat there. <laughs> she keeps me in line, you know. Because I get a little bit crazy if I'm left to myself. <laughs> it makes all the difference when you have someone on your side. Let me tell you something today. The creator of the universe is on your side. Yeah. Not because you deserve it. Not because you're good enough but because of grace. Amen. Grace. That's why Romans 8 and 31. What should we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? So quit fixating on, I didn't do this and I didn't do that and I did this in my past and this is against me, that's against me. If God be for you, who can be against you? Because once you have felt his grace, nothing else will satisfy you. Did you know that grace is looking for you? It's calling your name if only you will listen. Because ultimately we all have a common problem. In spite of our education, location, age, gender, color, ethnicity or ability, we're sinners. And our sin separates us from God. And it says, you are guilty. Romans 3.23 for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, being justified by His grace. Too many times we only quote the first part of that verse. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Yes, absolutely. But it doesn't end there. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. You see, sin condemned us, but grace called us and justified us and cleansed us. Romans 1, and it says, Romans 5 and 1, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, you didn't find God or grace. Grace found you. Through Christ, God's glorious grace has appeared, and it's calling your name. Because the cross stands as an eternal symbol of God's grace to sinful men. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You see, I look at the cross and I'm reminded that I matter. I look at the cross and I'm reminded that I am loved. I look at the cross and I hear grace calling my name. Have you heard the sweet, sweet sound of God's grace? Grace that looks beyond who you are and where you are and what you have done and where you have been. Grace that cleanses the sinner, pardons the guilty and sets the captives free. You know, John Newton was one such man. He was a man who had led a, a sinful life. He had been a captain of slave ships and invested in the slave trade. 
I mean, he had, ironically, he had even been enslaved uh, for a time in Sierra Leone in West Africa. And he was only set free because his father uh, paid a ship's captain to go and, uh, and, and, and get him. But you know, one fateful night, this man was caught in a terrible storm off the Donegal coast. And it looked like the ship was about to sink. And so he cried out to God for mercy. It, it seemed like the ship would be lost and, and all who were on it. But suddenly the, the, the storm just abated because God said, peace, be still. Grace. Grace. I mean, he had called on God, even as a man who dealt in human suffering and misery. And yet God had mercy on him and spared his life. Psalm 34 and verse 4. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all of my fears. They looked to him and were radiant and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried out and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. The new living. I prayed to the Lord and he answered me and he freed me from all my fears. Those who look to him for help will be radiant with joy. No shadow of shame will darken their face. Their faces. In my desperation I prayed and the Lord listened. He saved me from all of my troubles. In my desperation I prayed and the Lord listened. How many of you know God is listening to you? Grace. John Newton was just one in a long, long line of sinners who through the ages cried out to God for mercy and found refuge and peace and forgiveness at the foot of the cross. You see, death sought him, but grace found him first. How many of you are glad to say grace found me first? Thank you, Jesus. Grace found you first. That's why you're here today. God's grace found you. How many, how many of you say thank you, Lord? That grace found me. It wasn't your wisdom or your goodness or your ability that got you out. It was grace. You know, grace found you in the crack house or the whore house or even in the church house. How many of you know going to church doesn't get you to heaven? Receiving Jesus as your Lord and your Savior does. Grace. Grace is calling your name. Psalm 40 and verse 1. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He also brought me out, out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my steps. He has put a new song in my mouth. Praise to our God. Many will see it in fear and will put their trust in the Lord. Have you cried out to him in the midst of your, of your situation, in the midst of your trial and your troubles? He brought me out and he's going to bring you out in Jesus' name. He brought me out. Depression, obsession, sickness, debt, whatever it is, he's going to bring you out. You see, grace found you and grace has kept you and will keep you. You don't have to fear. The enemy can't have you. You are a trophy of God's grace. A.W. Tozer, the cross is the lightning rod of grace that short-circuited God's wrath to Christ so that only the light of his love remains for believers. Jesus took God's wrath at the cross so that we can experience his love, grace. And so it's amazingly, when you think of this with John Newton, by the time he reached Great Britain, he was a believer. The date was May 10th, 1748, a date he marked for the rest of his life. And yet, when you read his story and consider how many men and women, you know, had been taken from their families and all that they loved and held dear to be sold as slaves on, on, on foreign shores, condemned to a life of, of servitude and, and, and misery and hopelessness. I mean, was he actually deserving of forgiveness? No. But were you? Were any of us? No. That's what grace is. Grace is God's undeserved favor. And so, 
in the midst of the storm, in spite of his sin, this man heard grace calling his name. And it was this very same man, John Newton, that God used to write the words of the timeless hymn, Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. I, I, was, lo- I was blind, but now I see. You know, I think one reason why, why this hymn is so inspiring, so powerful, is because he was so honest. He didn't try and present, you know, his best, uh, his best foot forward. He was honest. I was a wretch. I was blind. I was lost. But grace, grace. And this man became a preacher and spoke against the slave trade. And a young British MP by the name of William Wilberforce, um, who recently had been saved, came to him because he was considering leaving politics, because he was having a crisis of conscience, because he was disillusioned. Um, But Newton encouraged Wilberforce to remain in Parliament and serve God where he was. I'm sure Newton was able to share um, his experiences, uh, uh, you know, as being a slave himself and also the horrors that he had witnessed on the slave ships. And uh, it's interesting that it was this very same William Wilberforce who eventually succeeded in having slavery banned in the British Empire. And at the end of his life, John Newton said this, although my memory is fading, I remember two things very well. I'm a great sinner. And Christ is a great savior. John Newton, 1725 to 1807. I remember two things very clearly. I'm a great sinner. Christ is a great savior. You know, these are the words of a man who understood God's grace. You know, this is a man who didn't make a very promising start in life. And yet, he heard grace calling his name. He heard grace calling his name. And you know, I don't believe that he ever forgot that moment when he was an unlikely recipient of God's glorious grace. He never forgot where God had brought him from. He was grateful for grace. Let me read this quote by um, John Newton again. I am not what I ought to be, and I am not what I want to be. I am not what I hope to be in another world, but still, I am not what I once used to be. And by the grace of God, I am what I am. You know, he was quoting the words of another great sinner who heard grace calling his name over the winds, over the waves of life, Paul the Apostle. 1 Corinthians 15 and 9, and it says, For I am the least of the apostles and do not deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, and yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it was I or they, this is what we preach and this is what you believed. Paul said, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And we can infer from this, therefore, that we can never be what we're called to be without grace. And that's why Christians who spend their life wrapped up in religion and legalism, trying to save themselves, trying to improve themselves, trying to, trying to do it in their strength, will invariably fail. It's always going to end in tears until you understand it is by grace. Just say that today, grace. Grace. Turn to your husband and say, grace. Grace. Give him a grace card today in Jesus' name. You know, today we read the words and sing the songs of men and women who through the ages heard grace calling their names. You know, never judge a book by its cover, nor judge a man or a woman by their past, because who knows what God may yet do in their lives by grace. Amen? Because, hey, that's a good place to say amen. Because as they say, while every... Every saint has a past. Every saint, every sinner has a future because of grace. And so grace calls us, and I'm just going to deal with the first point today. It was just my introduction. (laughs) Grace calls us to salvation. Titus 2.11, let me read it again from the New Living. For the grace of God has been revealed, bringing salvation to all people. What does grace bring? Salvation. Salvation. 
the Berean Bible. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to everyone. You see, it's for everyone. Will everyone receive salvation? Sadly, no. But the grace of God is offered to all mankind, young and old, male and female, Jew and Greek, rich and poor, black and white, east and west. It's for everyone. Luke 3 and 6. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Romans 10, 13. For whoever will call in the name of the Lord will be saved. You see, grace is for all people. And we are the vessels that God uses to bring his gospel of grace to a lost and a broken mankind. That's our calling. And this is the glory of the gospel. Forgiveness is offered to all. And you know what? In an age where lies and propaganda and you know, all sorts of deception uh, prevail in, in our world, it's important for us to understand that God's grace is what keeps us in Jesus' name. Because, you know, at a time where you can be subjected to trial by social media and, you know, uh, you're, you're guilty on, until proven uh, innocent and, and thereby you're subjected to ridicule, censure, and, and promptly canceled forever and ever and ever, um, we see the radical difference with Christ. Jesus is so different. The world doesn't understand grace. That's why they get all self-righteous about certain people. But it's a selective self-righteousness. That's why what you did 20 years ago can cancel you today. But this is the reality. You can never be woke enough or self-righteous enough for so-called liberals. Because they're anything but liberal. But grace calls us to a new beginning. 2 Corinthians 5.17 If any man is in Christ, he is a... New creature. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That's why the purity tests being applied in today's media are so hypocritical. That's why, you know, you see these, uh, you, you know, these, these adverts, you know, for vegans. And it says, uh, you know, dairy takes babies away from their mothers. And, and the very same people who want to call, uh, you know, a little calf a baby or a, a sheep or, or, uh, or sorry, a lamb uh, a baby, they will deny uh, that, that very word. They'll deny personhood to an unborn baby. And it's utterly hypocritical and ridiculous. It's this selective outrage. And that's not how God wants us to live. God wants us to walk in truth. And this is the beauty of the gospel. It offers true forgiveness. Yes, you did that. Yes, you were that. But grace has called your name and made you new. 1 Timothy 2.4 Who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Who desires all men. All, not some. God loves and values everyone. And, and you know what? In a world that's becoming increasingly divided and polarized where we're seeing a small group of globalist elites seeking to subjugate, manipulate, and ultimately dominate and control all of mankind, we see that God desires us to know Him and to be free. He loves the lowliest and the least, and this is why they will fail. The WEF, the WHO, the UN, whatever name you want to throw out there, Soros, Gates, whoever, they're going to fail because God loves people. God loves people. Amen. Hallelujah. And he wants us to be free. Glory to Jesus. And they're going to be relegated to the dustbin of history along with a long line of dictators and liars and despots and evil men and women who served Satan's purposes. They cannot prevail. They cannot prevail because God loves people. That's why I'm not afraid. Amen. That would be a good place to say amen. Some of you are saying, I have no idea what you're talking about, Pastor. That's okay. (laughs) Just don't take the chip. (laughs) Don't take the mark of the beast. (laughs) This is great. I don't have to carry my wallet. (laughs) Anyway, okay. This is the beauty of the gospel. It places value on everyone. Because we're all made in God's image. Genesis 1, 27. God made male and female in the image of God. That's it. That's why Satan wants to erase that image by trying to make men like women, make women like men. 
And that's the problem with androgyny. Ultimately, is if we're all like each other, that chemistry, that attraction that exists between male and female will no longer exist. You know, so many of the agendas really are ultimately about depopulation. You know, closing farms, it's not about saving the environment. It's about, you know, deliberately fermenting famines. You know, because if people are hungry, it's easy to control them. Easy to control them. Call me old-fashioned, but I like having food to eat. Amen. Amen. Anyway, this is the problem. Because globalists, and I use that term loosely, are really no different to those who went before them. Communists, socialists, Islamists, even Western imperialists. You know, European nations, some European nations acquired great wealth from nations they conquered plundering their natural resources, oppressing their native populations. And, you know, it's a reality. It happened. But this is the thing we need to understand. Those who did it often used ideas like eugenics and social Darwinism to justify their actions. And, and you know, it's, it's not a, a people try to remove all nuance from that. You know, the reality is the same way as God used the Roman Empire to bring the gospel through the world. You, you look historically, many of these empires you know, they, they opened the door for the gospel to go to the nations. It doesn't justify what they did. It just simply says, you know, God is able to, what the enemy meant for evil, God is able to turn to good. Amen? But, you know, eugenics is the racist mother of the modern abortion movement. You look into the origin, the, uh, you know, the origins of the, the abortion movement, and it's rooted in eugenics. You know, the founder of Planned Parenthood in the USA was Margaret Sanger, and she was a radical eugenicist. She referred to black people as weeds and believed that so-called defective races needed to be exterminated. Social Darwinism is the belief in the survival of the fittest. And it's this unbiblical idea that certain people are superior to others. And it was the very opposite of what Martin Luther King Jr. spoke about when he spoke about his children being judged by the, uh, the, the quant quality of their character rather than the color of their skin. And, and if you look historically, um, you know, social Darwinism uh, has been used to justify all kinds of evil over the last 150 years. Racism, ethnic cleansing, imperialism, even the mass murder of millions of innocent Jewish men, women, and children by the Nazis. Um, you know, on, it's, on, on Twitter, um, you know, the Auschwitz Museum, they, they release pictures every day of these beautiful little children, you know, taken from Belgium, taken from France, taken from various parts of Europe, just little toddlers, you know, with their little dollies or their, you know, and their short pants or their, just so, such beautiful little children just taken away. And, and it talks about the date they were taken to, to Auschwitz and then uh, put into a gas chamber and killed. I mean, it, it's, it's absolutely terrible. Terrible. And, and this is the danger I see our society right now. The, the more disconnected we become from biblical truth and objective truth, uh, you know, we will end up in, in that place again. We will end up in that place where terrible, evil things will happen because this is the reality. Education is not man's salvation. Jesus said you must be born again. The Nazis were highly educated and yet they did these evil things. They, like I said, six million uh, 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 you know, uh, men, women, and children. But this is the thing. Nazis embraced uh, eugenics as, as a core principle, as a core belief, and executed millions of Jews, gypsies, homosexuals, mentally and physically disabled people because they saw them as being less than. So this, this idea, and, and right now our society, Ireland, we're doing it. We're deciding, you know, you don't want the baby, just get rid of it. It's just a piece of tissue. What you're doing, that is, it's demonic and it's evil. And we need to be on our face in prayer and repentance. Because I believe, you know, I, I've no doubt that there are those who sought to justify the Irish famine as a manifestation um, of, of, of so survival of the fittest, social Darwinism. You know, the Irish were an inferior race destined for extinction. Therefore, what was happening was simply the thinning of the herd. I mean, over a million people starved to death on this island. Uh, millions of others uh, fled to the, to the States. And um, I, I don't think we should forget the lessons of history because it, it, those who, as the saying goes, those who forget the lessons of history are destined to repeat them. And, you know, I don't blame the British per se um, for what happened. I think we've, you know, made a, a religion out of blaming the British for everything. But in, in many respects, you know, I, I would blame much of what happened, I believe, 
uh, for the dangerous ideas that they were embracing at the time. These ideas of survival of the fittest. But you see, the Bible, however, teaches the tremendous value and significance of every human life. Lives that are made in God's image. Do you know that you're made in God's image? You, you, you're an image bearer of God. That's why Jeremiah 1.5, before you were born, I knew you. Before you were born, I knew you. That's, that's God's grace. Before you could stand up for yourself, before you could explain yourself, or before you could justify yourself, or, 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 or offer anything to anyone, God saw you right there in your mother's womb. Before, you, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you, and I ordained you to be a prophet to the nations. You see, God has a purpose for everyone. People are so precious to him. He loves everybody. And it's so important for us to remind ourselves of that. That people are so precious to God that he gave his son to save them from death. You see, God has revealed his salvation through Christ, the cross, and the empty tomb. Do you know the Bible is clear that Revelation 7.10, salvation belongs to God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. You see, there is no other ideology or philosophy or religion or religious or political leader that can save us from our sin. Jesus Christ is the way, the only way to heaven. John 14 and 6, Jesus answered, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Luke chapter 23, one of my most favorite passages And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots. And the people stood there looking on, but even the rulers with them sneered, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Christ, the chosen of God. The soldiers also mocked him, coming and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And an inscription also was written over him in letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing that you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we received the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, as sure that I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Grace. 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 Christ on the cross cried out, Father, forgive them. He could have cried out for vengeance, but he didn't. He, he could have cried out for God's wrath, he didn't. He could have cried out for, for God to, to, you know, send down far from heaven like, like they did in Sodom and Gomorrah, but he didn't. He could have cried out for armies of angels, but he didn't. Because grace. Grace, grace, hallelujah. Grace put him on that cross and grace kept him there. And he even prayed for mercy for the very man who stood there mocking him and rejecting him as he hung around the cross in their place. You know, Matthew chapter 27, as the worship group come forward. Matthew 27 and verse 44 Even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. Can you imagine that they were dying and even with their dying breath, they're cursing him, they're mocking him, they're rejecting him. Mark 15 and verse 32. Likewise, the chief priests also mocking among themselves that the scribes said he saved others, himself he cannot save. Let the cross, the king of Israel, descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. Even those who are crucified with him reviled him. It's interesting it recounts how the criminals were mocking Jesus and yet Luke, you know, seems to give a different version and says one believed. You see, none of the gospels say that only 
two others were crucified that particular day. There may have been more earlier that day or, or, or the day before, I don't know. But, but I personally believe that in the Gospel of Luke, the man who called on Christ was the same man who earlier had condemned and mocked Christ. But I believe that in, in his final moments, he was convicted of his sin. But either way, whether it was this man or, or another, either way, this hardened criminal in the final moments of his sordid life reached out to Jesus. And in those final moments, he finds grace. You know, this man was, was you know, moments earlier, I believe, mocking Jesus. But now he's, he's calling on Jesus. Why? Grace. Grace found him on the cross. And that's why I believe this passage recounts the original deathbed salvation. The original de deathbed conversion. With his final breath, this man received salvation from Jesus Christ. Why? Because God's grace. You know, he didn't have time to get baptized. He didn't have time to, to you know, ask forgiveness from his family or make restitution to those who he had hurt in his life. He didn't have time to go to Bible school. He didn't have time to do any of these things. And yet, right there, he, he reaches out to Christ and finds grace. That's why I don't believe, you know, that baptism saves us. I believe we're saved by faith in Jesus. This man didn't have an opportunity to be baptized. As important as baptism is, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. He was saved in the nick of time. Job 19 and 20. My bone clings to my skin and to my flesh and I've escaped by the skin of my teeth. Do you know that's where we get that term, by the skin of your teeth? This man was most likely a career criminal. He was a man with a past. But notwithstanding that, he heard grace calling his name over the jeers and the shouts of the crowd, over the judgment made by the magistrates. Even over the pain in his own body, he heard grace calling his name. And grace is calling your name today. Could you stand to your feet? He heard grace calling his name saying, I want you, even you. You know, Ephesians 2 says, by grace we have been saved. By faith, this is not of ourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. It's by grace and not by goodness that you and I have been saved. It's God's grace that saved us. It's God's grace that started this thing. And it's God's grace that is going to finish it. You know that hymn, we're going we're gonna to sing it now in a moment. But I, I love the line where it says, Through many dangers, toils and snares, I've already come. You've come through a lot of things in your life. Some of you, some of you should be dead. And many of your friends are. You should have overdosed or you should have taken your life. Or you should have, you know, been, died in a car crash or any of these other things that Satan had planned for you. But grace, grace stepped in. Grace stepped in and said, no. God's grace saved you and God's grace has kept you through many dangers, toils and snares I've already come tis grace has brought me safe thus far and grace will lead me home God's grace is going to lead us home God's grace, not our goodness not our efforts grace will lead you if you let it grace will lead you to, to mercy and to peace Grace will lead you to forgiveness and freedom. Grace will lead you to love and to liberty. If only you will allow grace to do what it wants to do in your life. If you will just surrender to Christ today. And so I want to give you an opportunity if you've never received Jesus as your Savior. 
If you've never responded to the grace of God, you can be saved today in Jesus' name. Martin Lloyd-Jones said this, this is my last quote. It is grace at the beginning and grace at the end. So when you and I come to lie upon our deathbeds, the one thing that should comfort and help and strengthen us there is the thing that helped us in the beginning. Not what we have been, not what we have done, but the grace of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. The Christian life starts at grace. It must continue with grace. It ends with grace. Grace, wondrous grace. By the grace of God, I am what I am. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. And that man has gone, is long gone into eternity. But he understood grace in the beginning, grace in the middle, grace at the end. So if you've never accepted Jesus as your Savior, with every head bowed, every eye closed, you can just bring it down for one moment. Are you saved? Have you surrendered to the grace that God offers to you through Jesus Christ? You have an eternal soul and you will spend eternity somewhere if you've never been saved. If you've never said yes to Jesus, put your hand up high today. If you're ready to surrender your life to Christ and receive the grace that He offers to you. Is there anybody here today? Ushers, help me. Don't be ashamed to put your hand up and say yes to Jesus Christ. If you've never surrendered to His grace, you've never received Him as your Lord and Savior, this is your moment to respond and say yes. Don't let pride stop you. Say yes to Him right now if you've never done so before. Is there anybody here today?